All right, so we're working on seeing the kingdom of God. And so far we've learned that the kingdom of God is coming in power one day, but that we are invited by Jesus to see glimpses of it and enjoy its blessings right now. And we also learned last week that absolutely everybody is invited to the kingdom of God and that no church, no religious people have the right to sell or check tickets because the kingdom and the human soul are loved by God and they belong to God and not us. And as we've gone, I've told us some stories about people who can see the kingdom and people who can't. And tonight, we're going to talk about the difference between those people and why the kingdom of God is sometimes so hard to see. And the short answer is that the kingdom of God is hard to see because a lot of times the kingdom of God doesn't make any sense. So David's brother Abi plays bass here for us sometimes. And I'm no Abi, but I do know my way around a bass guitar. So let's pretend uh, Miguel and, and Brenda, they have a store downtown uh, with used furniture and all kinds of amazing things at their shop. And let's pretend that Miguel calls me and he says that he just bought a pallet of bass guitar cases. Now, that might sound crazy to you, but that's something that might actually happen to Miguel someday. He might buy 6,000 desks and in the deal with 6,000 desks, they might throw in a whole pallet of bass guitar cases with who's no, who knows what inside. That's the kind of thing Miguel does every day. So let's say Miguel calls me, and he just bought a pallet of bass guitar cases, and he wants me to come look at them because he knows that I'm, I'm no obby, but I know my way around a bass guitar. And so I go to Miguel's shop, and Miguel says that if there's anything that I like in any of the cases, I have the first shot at buying it. So I'm digging through bass cases, and it's all the normal stuff, mostly Fender basses, until I open this old beat up case. And inside the old beat up case, it's just packed full of $100 bills. So I do some quick math and I realize that there's like a whole legal situation happening here, but a base case can hold about $2 million in $100 bills. I had to Google that, I've never done it personally, but yeah. A base case can hold about $2 million. And so Miguel's my friend, right? But is he a $2 million friend? I don't know. So I quickly shut the case, and I tell Miguel that I want to buy this one. Miguel says, what is it? And I say, well, you said I had the first shot at this, so don't ask any questions you don't want the answers to. And so Miguel's a man of his word, so he says, fine, I'll set you a fair price. $50,000 for whatever's in the case, just because he's suspicious. And now I'm stuck. I don't have $50,000 in cash. But I will have $50,000 in cash as soon as I buy this guitar case, right? So I run home, and I ask Miguel to hang on to my guitar case for me and not to look inside. And I take my guitars to the pawn shop, and I get like 50 bucks each, so I'm not even close to $50,000. So, oh man, what else can I sell? So... I sell my truck quickly on Facebook Marketplace. Then I sell Belen's car, and we're still not even close. It's like, oh, man, what am I supposed to do? So I call uh, Hugo Santana. Shout out to Hugo. He's our real estate agent. And I say, Hugo, I need to sell the house today. He says, all right, we can make that happen. And so we and Hugo sell our house. And I go back to Miguel's shop, and I've got $50,000 cash. And I say, here you go, Miguel. Let me have my guitar case. And so I walk out with no house and no car, and no guitars, but a guitar case full of $2 million. What I did make sense, right? I don't have a car or a house, but I do have enough money in this base case for me to fix that situation immediately. And what I did there was I sacrificed the stuff of my old life in order to set us up for a new and better life. I made the right moves, and I came out on top, and Miguel never has to know right? Jesus says that the kingdom of God is kind of like that. In Matthew chapter 13, 44, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And it makes perfect sense so far. Life in the kingdom of God, this is what the parable means, life in the kingdom of God is so much better than the life that you're living right now. So what we need to do is make the sacrifices to trade our old life for a new life and everything will work out really well for us the en in the end and we'll come out on top because God will be on our side. But then Jesus tells another story and on the surface, 
it seems like he tells the same story twice. But this next story is very different. Matthew 13, 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So again, that sounds like the same story, but it's not the same story. Let's say that I'm digging through the base cases at Miguel's shop, and I open a base case, and I find a 1961 Hofner violin base. Now, if you know anything about rock and roll history, and I know a little bit, you recognize this bass right away. This is the original bass guitar that Paul McCartney played and recorded with for the Beatles. It's a rock and roll legend, and it's the most important missing guitar in the world. That's right. In 1969, when the Beatles were working on Let It Be, Paul McCartney sent his Hofner bass back to Hofner so that they could work on it, and they worked on it, and the people who worked on it remember working on it, and then somehow it got lost between the Hofner factory and Paul McCartney, and he never got it back. So someone stole Paul McCartney's bass, the most famous bass guitar in rock and roll history. Somebody has it, and nobody knows where it is. So it might end up one day in Miguel's shop. That's a complete possibility. And let's say I find it, right? I find the most important, the most famous missing guitar in rock and roll history, and it's right there in Miguel's shop. What am I going to do? Well, I know what it is. So I close the case. And again, I ask Miguel if I can buy it. And he says, you know what? Sure. I'm suspicious, though, so that'll be $50,000. So again, I go sell our, ho our house and our cars, and I walk out of Miguel's shop with Paul McCartney's original Hofner violin bass, the most famous and important bass guitar ever. Does what I just did make sense? No. It doesn't make sense like walking out with a guitar case full of cash because Paul McCartney's bass is stolen. It still belongs to Paul McCartney. I can't sell it. The most I can do is return it to Hofner because Hofner has asked for it back. They're hoping that somebody will someday give Paul McCartney's bass back, which is not going to happen because it's Paul McCartney's bass. But there's no reward for it. Because all they're going to do is give it back to Paul McCartney. And if you admit that you have it, you've got some stolen merchandise on your hands and you can be in legal trouble. And that's why no one's ever going to give that bass guitar back. So let's say I walk out of Miguel's shop with Paul McCartney's bass guitar and I've got no house and no car and I didn't get any spending cash and I've got a really famous, really cool piece of rock and roll history, but I can't sell it. The only person that benefits from this is me. I can play it for my own enjoyment. I can open the case and I can stare at it and say, wow, this is really cool, but I can't tell anybody about it. I can't even kind of post on the internet that I've got it. The most I can do is maybe while me and my kids are sitting under the bridge, homeless, cooking our food over a little campfire, I can play them some Beatles songs on Paul McCartney's bass to keep them happy. And I don't think that they are going to assume that I made the right deal. They would rather have a house and a car than Paul McCartney's bass. So the story of the treasure in the field makes perfect sense. Sacrifice everything for more cash, and you come out on top. The story of the pearl of great price doesn't actually make any sense. Because you sacrifice everything, and you end up homeless with a little shiny pearl that only you can appreciate because you're the only one who cares that much about that pearl to give up everything to get it. And this is how it goes for us in the kingdom of God. And this is why I say the kingdom of God doesn't make any sense. For some of us, accepting the invitation to follow and obey Jesus makes our lives immediately radically better. We sacrifice our old attitudes, our old sins, our old addictions, our old hangups, and we find the power of the Holy Spirit to live in ways that are new and free and full of joy. That trade makes perfect sense. My old life for a new life. But for some of us, accepting the invitation to follow and obey Jesus makes our lives immediately radically worse. We give up on old friendships and relationships, but those were the relationships that supported us. We give up on the selfish attitudes that made us successful. 
we stop doing things that we enjoy doing because we know they cause us harm and we know that they offend God. And maybe we find ourselves like in a new job that pays less. Or we find ourselves alone on a Friday night with nowhere to go, just treasuring the kingdom of God all by ourselves while, our, while all of our friends and family are at the party. And that trade doesn't make a lot of sense. And it certainly doesn't make a lot of sense to our old friends who are still out in the world in the old way that we used to live, living it up. And so the strange logic of the kingdom is that when you make that trade of everything that you own for the thing that you think is most valuable, and that's Jesus' vision of hope for a new future for all of humanity. When you make that trade, you might end up like a farmer who bought a field full of money that immediately makes your life better, or you might end up like a pearl merchant all alone gazing at a beautiful thing that only you can appreciate. That strange logic and that weird outcome actually makes the kingdom hard to see, and it makes it really hard to see for certain kinds of church people. So let me tell you a story about that. I was in a church leadership meeting uh, a couple years ago, and the atmosphere was pretty gloomy. And just so you know, the people involved in this scenario are no longer part of our church. And so uh, we've already been through all that, and it was long enough ago that telling the story doesn't matter anymore. But there were personal tensions between the leaders in this meeting. And one of them was making it worse by prophesying that the church was going to run out of money in six months. And whenever that discussion comes up, the first place that churches tend to look is at their pastor's salary because it's usually the biggest light item in the budget of a small church. And this particular leader didn't care for me personally. And so he wanted to catch me in this question in front of the group. And he said this, John, you're our youth pastor. Why do we even have a youth ministry at all? What good have you done here to justify your salary? And I go, well, well, well. You know, and in my head, the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> is playing, right? Because that's what he wants. He wants kind of a showdown. So I just calmly gave the same response that I always give. I said, I work for the Lord, and the Lord has called me to disciple youth. And since I got here, I've personally discipled and counseled several hundred young people. And those young people grew in their faith, and they've left, and they've gone out into the world carrying their faith and the gospel and a better understanding of the Bible with them wherever they go. And they're going to share that understanding of the Bible, and they're going to share that gospel that we taught them out there in the world with people that you and me are never going to meet. And so that's what the investment in youth ministry is all about. We're sending people out, whether they know it or not. And this particular leader said, Aha, so you admit that these young people that you spend all your time on leave and go to other places. I said, yeah, well, they're young people. That's what they do. And I'm just happy that I get to contribute something to their spiritual life while we have the opportunity. And this leader said, you see, everybody, that's exactly why we shouldn't even do youth ministry at all. We never see the fruit of the work. That fruit always leaves with these young people and they go and join other churches out there in other cities and they give those churches their money and their support. But youth ministry and John's work does not actually benefit this church because those people that we invest in, they don't tithe here and they don't help here. And so youth ministry is a bad investment and a youth pastor is a bad investment and we should just scrap the whole thing. And I guess from a certain perspective, he's right. A lot of what we do as a church when it comes to counseling and ministering to people is not so that we can get a direct financial benefit back from the people that we're working with. It's because they need help. And someday those people will take our gifts elsewhere and share them with people that we'll never get to meet, but it doesn't actually directly benefit us. And so all the leaders in this meeting turned to look at me to see what my response would be. And I thought about talking about the families that had stayed at our church through all of our conflicts and our splits and things like that because their kids were attached to our youth ministry. And I also thought, man, if the church can't pay my salary, let's have that conversation. I'm not scared of that conversation. You know, if we can't, for, can't do this for financial reasons, let's, let's talk about it. But I figured 
that the issue there was a lot deeper than either of those things. And so I decided to try something that Jesus said. So I said, you know, Matthew 6, verse 32 says, Your father knows all about your material needs before you ask him. So seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And the leader went like this. And I thought, man, I thought I had seen it all in church work. But I saw a leader of a church go to something that Jesus said. What am I supposed to do with that? We're not even on the same page anymore. We're not even in the same book. And I realized that we were in trouble because I realized that our leadership as a church had confused the material success of our church with the kingdom of God. There's this German political philosophy called Realpolitik. Uh, it looks like real politic, but you pronounce it Realpolitik. I looked it up. And it basically states that in order to get things done in the real world, what we have to do is forget our morals and our ethics and our philosophy and our ideals and our higher purpose and just do whatever it takes to achieve certain political goals. The goal is what matters and we have to do whatever it takes in order to achieve that goal. An example of American realpolitik is when we back really horrible, ruthless dictators in the Middle East in order to keep the oil markets in those countries stable for the good of the American economy. But at the same time, we ignore all of the human rights abuses that go on under those dictators' leadership. The goal for our foreign policy then is cheap gasoline and so we do whatever we have to do in order to make gas cheap, and we ignore all the moral questions. And that's realpolitik. And I'm very concerned because in just talking to pastors and Christian leaders and my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm concerned that Christians and church leaders are adopting a philosophy of realpolitik when it comes to the kingdom of God because we've decided that our goal is political power, so we're gonna back a candidate even though he contradicts everything that Christ taught. And our goal is a good reputation as an organization, so we're gonna try and hide the child abuse that goes on in our organization. And our goal is financial growth, so we're gonna start to see human beings as tithers, as a source of money instead of as real people with real needs that Christ has called us to meet. And our goals as a church, I've noticed this over the last 10 years, not just as a church, a local church, but as a church in the United States, our goals are getting less and less spiritual and they're getting more and more pragmatic and practical. And we're tempted more and more to ignore our higher calling and just do what works for whatever sort of political goal we have set up. And in our case, in the case of that meeting, that realpolitik mindset kept our leaders from seeing that when you help young people through adolescence and through young adulthood and into marriage and to start young families and you help them through that transition process out of their parents' house so that they're on their own with their own strong faith in God, that helping of them is the kingdom of God and even, you know, even though we don't always get a material benefit back from them immediately, those leaders couldn't see that sending those kids out into the world to share their faith in other places is the kingdom of God. Those leaders wanted the money buried in the field, but they couldn't appreciate the value of the pearl. And so they only had half of the kingdom of God going for them. And when you only have half, you kind of miss the whole thing. Now, I'll admit that youth ministry and any real kind of discipleship is not perfect, and it's not very efficient. A lot of those young people will leave and they'll wander away from God in their 20s and they'll maybe come back to God at some other church in some other city in their 30s once they have kids. And some of us have done youth ministry before and so you know that working with students is a huge drain on your time, right? You sit down and you talk to them and it usually goes into all hours of the night and they're very real serious issues for these kids 
but it takes all of your heart and it takes all of your attention and it takes all of your time and it takes all of your effort. And that time, helping a 15-year-old kid and answering their Bible questions and teaching them to pray and helping them through their family conflicts and relationships and helping build their self-esteem. When that kid turns 25 and we see that on Facebook they change their religious affiliation to atheist, it kind of looks like all those hours that we spent around a fire over here in the backfield at midnight just talking to them about what was on their heart. It kind of feels like all that was wasted time. And a lot of the time it looks like that with adult ministry too. If you've ever pastored anyone or prayed for anybody or been th with somebody as they've gone through a difficult situation, you pour hours and hours and hours of your life into them and all this emotional energy and all this care and compassion. And sometimes people just don't get it. And sometimes they don't grow. And sometimes the thing that you warn them about is the thing that they do. And sometimes the whole thing just looks like a waste of time. But that's what the kingdom of God is. That inefficient, illogical time that we spend talking to people and helping people in a way that will never directly benefit us or our organization. That is the kingdom of God. And that is the kingdom of God because that is how God himself works. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, it says, He told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. If you've never farmed, you might not get what this parable is about right away, but it's really easy to understand when you know one thing. Seeds cost money. The seeds you plant on your farm cost money. In fact, it costs a lot of money to plant like an acre for crops. And so if someone hired me to plant his field and I took those seeds that he bought to plant that field and I dumped some of them on the road and I dumped some of them on rocky soil and I dumped some of them in a thorn thicket and then I put some of them in the good soil instead of all of them in the good soil, that farmer would fire me right away. Because good planting is precise and efficient and wise. And good farmers do everything they can to cut down on waste. And all that means that by our standards, God is a bad farmer. And he calls us to be bad farmers too. God sends sunshine and rain on the wicked and the good so that everybody has enough to eat, whether they love him or not. And he also sends his message of love and righteousness to people who will never receive it. And he sends that message through us, through you and me, and through our organization as the body of Christ. God wants to work with people like children, like young people, like elderly folks, like poor folks, like the sick like cynical and skeptical people, people who will never give us any grain or immediate benefit in return for all our effort because they can't. God wants us to work with people who give us headaches and who drain our time and who make life difficult and who throw a monkey wrench in the, in the workings of our organization. And so even though it looks illogical from our point of view, God wants us to throw our seeds on the road and on the rocks and among the thorns. Because God is that generous and God is that good. God wants us to stop counting everything and to just do the work that he's called us to do, knowing that three quarters of the work that we do to share his message, three quarters of that work, the road, the rocks, and the weeds, three quarters of that work will not bear fruit and will not benefit us and will look like a waste of time. Because God wants us to understand that even though those people reject our effort or they drain our energy or they don't give anything back to us right away, those people are worth our time and our effort. If we want to see the kingdom of God all around us and participate in it, we have to understand that sometimes it's a field full of money 
but a lot of times it's an illogical pearl that nobody else appreciates except for those of us who are in on the joke. And to really value that pearl, we have to stop trying to count its value and just love it for what it is, cost and all. Because, like Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seeking the kingdom comes first. And a lot of times it won't make sense. But if we don't seek it first, we'll miss it altogether. What does that look like? Uh, it was Easter about four years ago. And the pastor called me to, into his office, and he said, it was Easter morning. We were going to have a joint service between the English service and the Spanish service. Uh, music was going to be played by both groups. He was going to preach a little bit, and I was going to preach a little bit. It was a huge production, and we were focused on it. And we didn't have a lot of time to mess around. But the pastor called me to in, into his office, and he said, there's somebody here that needs to talk to us. Will you help me? And I said, Yeah. And the guy who wanted to talk to us was there with his parents, and he said that he had been possessed by a demon. And part of me goes like, dude, I don't have time for this right now, and neither do you. Like, we're, we're on in five minutes. You know what I mean? The, the show has to start. We got to talk to this guy who says he's possessed by a demon. Like, I, I, don't even, I don't even know what we're doing here. So... I decided instead to pay attention to this guy and the pastor obviously wanted to. And so we said, okay, explain your story. And this guy had this big long story about how for years he'd been dreaming of demons and he'd been vomiting like on the exorcist and they had had a Passover meal on Friday night at their church. And he'd gotten up right in the middle of the meal and flipped over the table and, and vomited all over it and was shouting profanity and like ancient Assyrian to all the people at the, at the feast, you know, like regular old demon stuff, right? Just like any demon movie you've ever seen. And I'm like, wow, I, I don't know what to do with this because I don't even know how much I believe that that's what demonic possession actually looks like because that's not exactly how we find it in scripture and things are different now. And so I don't quite understand how we can help. And I felt like the Lord just told me, just ask him. So I asked this young man, what is it that you would like us to do for you? And he said, when we got up this morning, we really felt like we needed God's help for what's wrong with me. And so in the sat nav in our car, we put in churches nearby. And it gave us all the churches that are here in North McAllen. He said, this is the fifth church that we've been to. And because all of them are busy with their Easter program, none of the pastors actually wanted to talk to us. You guys are the only ones that actually made time. I said, okay. And he said, all I feel like I need is for some real Christians to put their hands on me and to pray that the demons will go away. So you know what? I can do that, right? You're not asking too much. And so the pastor and I put our hands on this young man because he asked us to, and we prayed that the demons would leave him. And afterward, he said he felt better, but there was no moment where the demons came out screaming like we see in the Gospels or anything like that. So they said thanks, and they left. And the pastor said, do you really believe that kid was possessed by demons, or was it just some kind of psychological problem? And I said, I don't think it matters. Somebody asks you to pray for them in the name of Jesus, you can do it, right? Whatever is happening with him is obviously something that is a problem for him. And so if he feels like praying for him in the name of Jesus is going to help, I mean, we can do that. That's our bread and butter. Let's just do it. He's like, yeah, you're right. And so... Uh, the next Wednesday, I never actually saw the guy again, but the next Wednesday they came to our Wednesday night service and they stood up in the service and told the whole church about how the two pastors of this church had liberated his life from the demon possession and how he was completely different and how everything in his life was better now. And so I don't know what that kid was going through and I don't know what that so-called demon possession felt like for him and I don't know what good we actually did by praying for him. But I know that we took the time. And in hearing these people talk weeks and months later, that time that we took to pay attention to them in a way that never honestly came back to us in any kind of tangible benefit, 
that time that we took and that time that we invested actually made all the difference for this kid and his family. And I don't know where they are, and I don't know what they're doing right now. They're not here. But the last I heard of them, they were actually doing pretty well. And they were still telling people that there was a church in McAllen, Texas, where the pastors took time on Easter morning before the service to pray for them. And I'm just as practical and just as pragmatic and just as cynical as anybody else. I don't like spending my time on things when I'm not sure that it's worth the effort. I don't like spending time with people that just drain my energy and then we never see any growth. I don't like doing things that make us look foolish. And when there's something to do, like that Easter service or a church service or whatever, I definitely don't like it when someone pops up in my way and tries to distract me from the thing that we have to do. But a lot of times, the kingdom of God is in those moments. The kingdom of God is in kids running up to Jesus so that he can pray for them, even though the disciples think that it's a distraction from his mission. The kingdom of God is in Jesus healing sick people and casting out the demons of demon-possessed people and feeding poor people and all these people that the disciples looked at and said, those people aren't worth the effort. The kingdom of God for Jesus was in sitting by a well and spending a long time talking to a Samaritan woman who had been divorced five times, who, for all intents and purposes in her time, should have been an outcast that nobody talked to. For Jesus, he was perfectly comfortable with those moments when it wasn't a field full of money. He was comfortable with those moments when the kingdom of God was that precious pearl that only he understood. And he tried to teach his disciples to understand that, but his disciples were caught up with all of the logical investment and return thinking that runs so much of our world. And I have to be honest, that kind of thinking gets me too. And it gets all of us who are trying to serve the Lord. But if we want to see the kingdom of God among us, we have to figure out how to open our eyes to the kingdom of God when God brings it to us and a lot of times, it's not going to look the way that we expect it to or the way that we want it to or the way that benefits us the most. So if we want to be there and we want to enjoy that kingdom of God, we've got to understand how to value and love the pearl, even when we're the only ones and even when it costs us everything. <laughs>